Now, again, going back, for example, to to uh, Second Nephi chapter ten, where uh, uh, Jacob just completes, and this there's other statements in the Book of Mormon on this, uh, where Jacob completes then his statement in the whole chapter with with the idea, wherefore may God raise you from death by the power of the resurrection and also from everlasting death by the power of the atonement. Now let me follow through a little further with you on that, may I? There's a power of resurrection. This comes upon all people, sons of perdition included. There's a power of atonement which Christ achieved and acquired. This only is, is only extended to those who come to him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and who obey his gospel. Now, it has some unconditional benefits we'll talk about a little later, but uh, uh, as we partake of the sacrament, for example, you partake of the bread, symbolic of what? The broken body. You partake then of the water, symbolic of what? The blood. What blood? And the answer is Gethsemane, the blood that came from every pore of his body as he paid the debt of sin. You see that? Uh, the power of the resurrection then passes on all people. The power of atonement is a different ballgame, and it's in Gethsemane that uh, that he acquired the power of the atonement. And uh, it's here that he made a sacrifice as a divine being. Now granted, you don't have anything in the scriptures that says, thus saith the Lord, uh, he uh, paid the debt of sin in, in Gethsemane. But as you read what the prophets have said, particularly the prophets of the Book of Mormon, and then you go to that sacred episode of Gethsemane and the cross, then you come out with an entirely different picture than what the world has. And that, again, is one of the benefits, the great benefits now, of uh, the uh, uh, atonement, and uh, as revealed in the, in the Book of Mormon. Let me turn to 1 Nephi chapter 11 now, verse uh, 32. Here's uh, Nephi's statement concerning the uh, crucifixion of Christ. Verse 32 to 33. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me again, saying, Look. And I looked and beheld the Lamb of God, that he was taken by the people. Yea, the Son of the everlasting God was judged of the world. And I saw and bear record. And I, Nephi, saw that he was lifted up upon the cross and slain for the sins of the world. And after he was slain for the I saw the multitude of the earth that they were gathered together to fight against the apostles of the Lamb. Now, as we see, as we see this picture, we need to go back to, to some of the great testimonies uh, in uh, uh, the Book of Mormon in order to, to round out and get a fuller picture of the, of, uh, the atonement than that which we have in, in the New Testament, for example. Uh, here in Mosiah chapter 15, and this is one of the, the sacred statements in the, in the Book of Mormon, you have uh, uh, Abinadi making some very pertinent explanations, beginning here now with verse 19. He says, For it were not for the redemption which he hath made for his people, which was prepared from the foundation of the world, I say unto you, were it not for this, all mankind must have perished. But behold, the bands of death shall be broken, and the sun reigneth, and hath power over the dead. Therefore he bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead. And there cometh a resurrection, even a first resurrection, yea, even a resurrection of those that have been, and who are, and who shall be, even until the resurrection of Christ, for so shall he be called. And now the resurrection of all the prophets, and all those that have believed in their words or all those that have kept the commandments of God shall come forth in the first resurrection. Therefore, they are the first resurrection. They are raised to dwell with God who has redeemed them. 
Thus they have eternal life through Christ, who has broken the bands of death. And these are those who have part in the first resurrection, and these are they that have died before Christ came in their ignorance, not having salvation declared unto them, and thus the Lord bringeth about the restoration of these, and they have a part in the first resurrection, or have eternal life, being redeemed of the Lord. And little children also have eternal life. Now the gist of what he's saying, my brothers and sisters, and he's speaking of a time beforehand, what he's saying now is that there would be a resurrection from the time of Adam down through and including the uh, resurrection of Christ. And who would this include? Who does he say it will include? Well, it will include all the prophets and all the righteous who have lived then uh, from the time of Adam down through to the resurrection of Christ. And in this, then, uh, Christ is the first fruits. He comes forth, the first individual to, to come forth from the grave. And uh, as he comes forth from the grave, then, and uh, visits his people there in Jerusalem, then he invites them to, to uh, see and behold. In Luke 24, he says, Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone, as you see me have. And then as he came to the, to the Nephites, then he uh, gave them uh, this great testimony of the resurrection. Here in, in uh, 3 Nephi chapter 11, and we all know the story as these people later in the year uh, when Christ was crucified, later in the year as they were gathered together, and apparently, apparently Nephi, who was their prophet, must have been given some preliminary instruction in regard to the matter. Because you have 2,500 people then are called together there at the temple in the land of Bountiful. And as they're there called together by Nephi and talking about the events that are take place, they hear this voice in the heavens which they cannot understand. And as they uh, ponder on it and finally open their hearts to hear then this voice says, Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name, hear ye him. And it came to pass, it says, that they cast their eyes up again toward heaven, and they saw a man descending out of heaven, and he was clothed in the white robe. And he came down and stood in the midst of them. And uh, then he bears testimony concerning himself, saying, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified should come into the world, Behold, I am the light and the life of the world, and I have drunk of that bitter cup which the Father hath given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world, into which I have suffered the will of the Father. And then he gives them a sacred and sublime opportunity. There's 2,500 of them gathered there, and he has them line up in a line and says, All right, now I want you to come to me and see for yourself and understand for yourself about the atonement and about the resurrection. And the record says, Arise and come forth unto me, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and have been slain for the sins of the world. Now, we have what I call, and I don't mean to be critical, but we have a, a kind of an elder brotherism in the church, where the only thing Jesus is to many of us is our elder brother, a great brother. He made the atonement, he pats us on the back, and he encourages us along, but primarily in our minds, he is only our elder brother. I don't know whether you've got that uh, attitude down here or not in Snowflake or not all through the Wasatch Front. Now, it is true that Christ is our elder brother. That's true, but that's only part of it. He's graduated. Many of you folks uh, lived through World War II. I was a field sergeant in the first... But can you picture yourself back in those days of... Uh, say, a private coming up to five-star General Eisenhower. You've got those five stars up here. 
And now General Eisenhower, before he got those five stars, was once a lieutenant. He graduated from West Point, and he was a lieutenant. And the lieutenant was his great office. But this, this thoughtless but private comes up to General Eisenhower and says, Lieutenant, I've got a message for you. And here he is with the five stars out there. Now, what do you think Ike would do? You see that? Now, Jesus is our elder brother. But believe me, he's graduated. By the appointment of the Father, he is our Lord and our God. And as he came to the Nephites, he says now, Handle me and see, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and have been slain for the sins of the world. That's all five stars. You see that? And it says, And it came to pass that the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side and did feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. And they, this they did do. And note how meticulously now uh, Mormon writes this. And this they did do, he says, going forth one by one until they had all gone forth. Note how positively now he reports it. And, the, and did see with their eyes, and did feel with their hands, and did know of a certainty, and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. Can you get any more certain and positive? All right, so he bore them this sacred testimony of uh, the resurrection. Now, let me go back. We've, we've gone to, to Mosiah chapter 15, and I know this is a hard chapter to understand, and I sympathize with you as you grapple with it. But let me just bear you my testimony that it's one of the greatest statements concerning Christ anywhere in sacred literature, Mosiah 15. And let me challenge you to read that and read it and reread it and pray about it until you know what he's talking about. If John 17 and 3 is true, this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. If that's true, you cannot be exalted without knowing thoroughly Mosiah 15. It just can't be done. And it's revealed here. And if we'll apply ourselves, we can understand it. All right, now note now how this relates to the resurrection. I would that you should know, Abinadi says, that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. We call him the Son of God, and in our minds, when we say that, we think of the flesh and the relationship with the man of holiness in the flesh. All right, it says, And having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son. Now, let me give you some other statements on that. Uh, Ether chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus to the brother of Jared. Behold, I am he who was prepared from the foundation of the world to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. Now, how more positively can you be? In me shall all mankind, and the old version says light. The new modern version says life. That's one little change that the brethren have apparently found uh, an error in the original. In me shall all mankind have life, and that eternally, even they who shall believe on my name, and they shall become my sons and my daughters. So we're sons and daughters of Jesus Christ in the gospel covenants. Okay? He ceases to be our elder brother. He is our Father. He is our Lord and our God. Okay? Now on that plane then, Abinadi says, because he dwelleth in the flesh, he should be called the Son of God, and having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son, 
The Father, because he was conceived with the power of God. In conception, the divine power, the glory, he had life in himself like the Father had life. That was planted in him. And essentially, that somewhat made him the Father. See, it wasn't just that I can now represent that Father. See, the gospel is not just principles and representative uh, authority. The gospel is power. When a man speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, who's speaking? The individual is articulating it, but who's giving it from back there? You see that? All right, the Holy Ghost is. And so there's a power relationship there, see? Now, what was the situation with Jesus? He's conceived with the divine nature in him. And so the Father is in him. On one occasion, for example, and this is John chapter 14, Philip comes up to him rather innocently and says, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice us. It's one of those experiences, except for the Savior's graciousness, where, you know, he'd have just said, <laughs> you know, just literally in, in disgust. Hey, don't you know who I am? Now look at it in that light, see? It says, Philip saith unto him, Show us the Father, and it'll suffice us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you that... that uh, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Don't you know and understand yet? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. I know how the missionaries use that, and I've done it myself, and I would still do it, because that application is correct, that you've got two beings, one looks exactly like the other, and if you see one, you sense you see the other. But that's not what Jesus was saying. I know what he was saying. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Now, what's he saying there? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Okay? You remember we said here, drew them on the board, that you've got uh, two, you've got the Father here and you've got Christ over here. And there's a revelatory principle. And that revelatory principle then is such that while Jesus articulated the words, the Father within him, you see that? He's the Father and the Son. He's a dual being, as the Book of Mormon testifies. Right, now going back then to, to Mosiah and picking up the story, because this is the key to the understanding of not only the atonement but the resurrection. It becomes the key of insight and understanding. He goes on and says, The Father, because he was conceived by the power of God in conception, that power was centered in him, and he had glory in him in conception. The Father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the Son, because of the flesh, thus becoming the Father, the power, and the Son, all embodied in one being. Is that clear? He says, and they, this, they, the two, the, the Father in him and the Son, and they are one God, the very eternal Father of heaven and earth. Okay? Now note how he brings it into the resurrection. Thus the Spirit, becoming subject to the flesh, pardon, thus this flesh becoming subject to the Spirit, let's get it the way we should have it, Thus the spirit becoming subject, or the flesh becoming subject to the spirit, or the son. The son feature is the flesh feature. The spirit feature is the father feature. Okay? Thus this, the flesh becoming subject to the spirit, or the son to the father, being one God, suffereth temptation, and yieldeth not to temptation, but suffereth himself to be mocked and scourged and cast out and disowned by his people. And after all this, after working many mighty miracles among the children of men, he should be led, even as Isaiah said, as a, lamb, as a sheep before the shear is dumb, so opened not his mouth. So he opened not his mouth. Yea, even so he shall be led, crucified and slain. The flesh, now let's come back to this for the atonement, the flesh becoming subject even unto death, the will of the Son, the flesh within Christ, the will of the Son being swallowed up in the will of the Father. 
And thus God, Christ, thus God breaketh the bands of death, having gained the victory over death, giving the Son power to make intercession for the children of men. Now, I don't know whether we can understand that, but what I'm trying to say is this, that in those words, in those words of explanation, uh, is, if we understand them, the closest thing that I know of how Jesus finally was able to do it. Okay? All right, now, as the Savior then came forth, bore witness then to the resurrection, then there were also others who came forth and who were resurrected at that time. In uh, 3 Nephi 23, we have uh, one of the little statements of the human nature of some of the early of the Nephite prophets. One of the great things that happened in uh, this whole uh, scenario of, uh, of judgments that took place at the crucifixion of Christ and the darkness and then uh, the light and the peace that followed after the three days of, of darkness, one of the things that took place was that many people who these Nephites had known had died started walking around the streets with them. And uh, they knew then that they had been resurrected. Now, apparently, even as dramatic as that was, they didn't record it. And so when the Savior finally makes his appearance to them, then the whole issue comes up. He brings it up. And uh, beginning here with verse 7, it says, It came to pass, this is chapter 23, And it came to pass, he said unto Nephi, Bring forth the record which ye have kept. And when Nephi had brought forth the records and laid them before him, he cast his eyes upon them and said, Verily I say unto you, I commanded my servant Samuel the Lamanite. Now this is Helaman 14, verse 25. I commanded my servant Ham Samuel the Lamanite that he should testify unto the people that at the day when the Father should glorify his name in me, that is, in my resurrection, that there should be many saints who should rise from the dead and should appear unto many, and should minister unto them. And he said to them, Was it not so? Didn't you record that? With, well, didn't Samuel say that? And his disciples answered and said, Yea, Lord, Samuel did prophesy according to thy words, and they were all fulfilled. And Jesus said unto him, How be it that ye have not written these things, that many saints did arise and appear unto many, and did minister unto many, and it came to pass that Nephi remembered, rather chagrinly, uh, Nephi remembered that uh, this thing had not been written. And it came to pass that Jesus commanded that it should be written, and uh, therefore it was, was written. Now, can you see the uh, relatively, oh, it's a sidelight to the whole show, but what does it tell us? What does it tell us? That the prophets, as the Book of Mormon prophesied, Mosiah 15, spoke of a resurrection. It would take place from Adam's day on down. And then it actually happened. You talk about life after life. This is far better than anything that we know of that's going on in the world generally, where they talk about life after life. This is the grave after the grave. <coughs> or coming from the grave after you've been in the grave, you see. And you've got some of your friends who have come forth, and you know it, and it's recorded. Now, we have in section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants a statement by the prophet Joseph Smith, given to us by Revelation, uh, <clears throat> where he talks about those who were resurrected at Christ's resurrection. Verse 54, Yea, and Enoch also... And they who were with him, and the prophets who were before him, and Noah also, and they who were before him, and Moses also, and they who were before him, and from Moses to Elijah, and from Elijah to John, that is John the Baptist, who were with Christ in his resurrection. See, And so we have, we have sacred testimony concerning the reality of the resurrection. 
not just from the Nephite scriptures. Read, for example, uh, 1 Nephi 15, where Paul delineates the resurrection and indicates that there were 500 people at one time to whom the Savior made his appearance. Like, like the 2,500 uh, 2, of the Nephites, there were 500 people of the Jewish saints to whom he appeared. And he says many of them are still alive and, and haven't died, these people who were there on the scene when the Savior was there. See. And uh, you couple that scene then with the witness of the Book of Mormon that Jesus came forth and showed himself as a resurrected being to those who were on this continent, the dual testimony of two nations, and then also the testimony uh, given in Matthew that many came forward and showed themselves to the Jewish saints, couple that then with the testimony that the Book of Mormon gives that many of the Nephite saints came forth. See? And you've got a basis of assurance that the resurrection is a literal reality. And that just as that resurrection, which then was called the first resurrection, so also will there be a first resurrection for us, which will take place in connection with Christ's second coming, more specifically as he stands upon the Mount of Olives and appears to the Jewish people, or just before that. All right, now as we talk about the resurrection, let me... Let me deal with it in the sense of some important ideas that uh, we need to be clear on so that the challenge of living the gospel can be more intelligently founded in our lives. Now, I'm talking about the resurrection of a literal physical body. I've heard it expressed, for example, that uh, in the resurrection you get a body. And uh, what I want you to see is in the resurrection, you get your body. And then you think about that and ask yourself, uh, what am I going to do about that? And what can I do about it now? Because you can reap tremendous benefits by doing something now, benefits that will have their fruition in the resurrection. And they'll make all the world of difference to you. Now here in Alma, for example, chapter 11, you have uh, Amulet's great testimony here concerning uh, uh, the resurrection. Let's uh, begin reading with verse 42. He says, Now there is a death which is called a temporal death, and the death of Christ shall loose the bands of this temporal death, that all shall be raised from this temporal death. The spirit and the body shall be reunited again. Now, it doesn't say just physical elements. The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Both limb and joint shall be restored, and so forth, to its proper frame, even as we are now. And, he says, and we shall be brought to stand before God, knowing even as we now know, and have a bright recollection of our guilt. If we're guilty, hopefully we're not. He says, Now this restoration shall come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, both wicked and righteous, and even there shall not so much as the hair of their heads be lost. And all of us bald ones are going to have a real glorious time on that occasion. Okay? He says, But everything, everything, shall be restored to its perfect frame as it is now or in the body and shall be brought and be arraigned before the bar of Christ the Son and God the Father and the Holy Spirit, which is one God, to be judged according to their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. All right, there's a literal resurrection. It's our body. In section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the, uh, the Lord gives us an uh, even more explicit statement concerning uh, the literal nature of the resurrection. Verse 27, he says, They who are of a celestial spirit shall receive the same body, and underscore the word same, it's the same body, which was a natural body. Even ye shall receive your bodies. See, it's the same and it's your bodies. And your glory shall be the glory by which your bodies are quickened. Ye who are quickened by a portion of the celestial glory, and here comes the rub on this thing now, shall then receive the same even a fullness. Now what is he saying? 
You're going to get your body, we are, going to get our individual bodies, and then those that have been quickened before resurrection by a portion of the glory of the celestial kingdom. Now that portion is given not just by believing in temple marriage and believing the three degrees, that portion is given by getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the baptism of fire. That's a portion of the celestial glory. We're talking about a transformation now that needs to take place. We're talking about uh, a change by divine power that we in this state have to undergo and go through by reason of our faith and of our constant service and devotion, living outside ourselves in service to others and fulfilling the laws of righteousness. Then the Spirit of the Lord begins to come in and we receive a portion of of the glory of the celestial kingdom. And then if we have received that, then on the day of resurrection, what's the promise? Then you'll receive the same, even a fullness. Now some people think, for example, that the judgment is going to be a hard thing. In some ways, it's not that difficult. It's just an issue then of the Lord saying, all right, uh, all of you people who have so sanctified yourself that you can receive a fullness of celestial glory, when we turn a little bit loose on you, you'll receive it on the principles of natural affinity, on the principles of prior preparation, on the principles of being able to receive it lawfully, and the rest of you it just won't have much effect on, and you'll come up in the resurrection without it. It's just going to be that simple. And he goes on to say, they who are quickened by a portion of the terrestrial glory, if that's all they've qualified for, then they shall receive the same even a fullness. And those then who have dallied along the way and committed great sins and transgressions and finally had to wait till they get in, in the spirit world under the condition of hell and, and judgment there during the whole thousand year period but still repent, they'll finally then come forth and they've been quickened by a portion of the telestial glory and they shall receive a fullness of that, see? And it's just that, it's just that simple. It's just that simple. All right, now what's the importance then of understanding the literal resurrection? I've got a physical body. And uh, my challenge now is to discipline that. My challenge is to live outside myself in service to the Lord so that the power of his spirit can come into my life. And as the power of his spirit comes into my life, it's a Holy Spirit, and it purifies my life, purifies, and uh, performs those necessary transformations in me so that my body is finally laid down in the grave. But when I pick up those same elements, and they've been acted on by the spirit, see, I pick up those same elements then those elements have been prepared so that when I get them again, then I can get an endowment of celestial glory. Now that is what the ball game is all about. Now some people have an objection to that. They say, hey, that can't be true because the physical body is continually changing. Now we have to understand that. Here, for example, is a statement by the prophet Joseph Smith, and I think if I've got another one here, uh, I'd like to give you from Brigham Young, where he's talking about the same general uh, thing. Well, maybe I haven't. But here's the prophet. Orson Pratt had been talking about the resurrection, and the prophet is built on some of the ideas that Orson expressed. He says, to a remark by Elder Orson Pratt that a man's body changes every seven years. President Joseph Smith replied, there is no fundamental principle, and note you have to dwell on fundamental here, there is no fundamental principle belonging to a human system that ever goes into another in this world or in the world to come. I care not what the theories of men are. We have the testimony that God will raise us up, and he has power to do it. If any man supposes that any part of our bodies, that is the fundamental parts thereof, ever goes into another body, he's mistaken. All right, now let me put it this way. Brigham Young explained this, and uh, others have, 
within the physical body, there are both fundamental and non-fundamental elements. The fundamental elements are the basic scaffolding. I must have left that, Brother Clay. I'll just explain it to you. The fundamental elements are the basic scaffolding. And these fundamental elements never change. Now, in the area of non-fundamental elements, and there are fundamental elements in the bone and in the uh, lymph and in the tissue and so forth. See, there are fundamental elements in but And then there are non-fundamental elements. And the non-fundamental elements are taken into the body, as Brigham Young says. They contribute to a sustenance, and they're passed off. But the fundamental elements never do leave the physical organism while it's still alive. And after its death, they never do go into the making of the fundamental elements of any other body. They may go into another body to become part of the non-fundamental elements and contribute to its sustenance, but there's somehow an action that's taken so that when the, when the fundamental elements are identified with the organized spirit on that plane of fundamental elements, when that takes place, there's an imprint, a transformation that takes place so that it is not possible for those elements to ever go into the making of the fundamental elements of another body. And you let those elements go where they will. On the day of resurrection, the power of the resurrection will bring those elements forth. And we will receive our bodies. And then the question will be, have we sanctified ourselves? here in the flesh. And have we met the challenge then of living in such a way so that our bodies are purified and our souls then are right before the Lord? Years ago, I was in one of the state presidencies on BYU campus, first counselor in a BYU state presidency. And our state visitor was that great and loving and beloved uh, LeGrand Richards. And uh, I always enjoy hearing him teach the gospel. But on this occasion, I had a special intimate relationship with him that has always stayed with me. As you may know, the brethren in connection with the state conference uh, spend considerable time talking with the state presidency and that kind of thing. And uh, we were meeting in my office there on BYU campus, and LeGrand Richards was sitting there with us in my office, and I was sitting right next to him. Now, aside from the counsel that he gave, which was precious, the thing that just literally overpowered me was just the total sense of purity in the man. You could literally see purity in the physical form, in the physical features, in the physical elements. There was just a purity that was just crystal that was almost overpowering to me to sit there beside him with the purity of that physical uh, being so evident after that life of service that he's lived and after the thrill of having the Spirit of the Lord in his teachings and he had run through him and, and so purified his life, that you just simply had a crystal clear, pure being sitting there. And I just, I, I could hardly look at him. I just kind of look at him in the side, and, and, and this, the purity of his soul had just come through, boom, 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 uh, and bear witness to me that, that here is a man who has lived in such a way that the sanctifying powers of the gospel in his life. Now, what's going to be his result or the benefit on the day of resurrection? He's going to get that same body, and those physical elements are going to be so pure that when he gets them again in their pure element and the corruption of mortality is gone, that the powers of glory will then be able to center in him. Can you see that? Now, can we take that as, a, as an example and as a challenge? Now, in the resurrection, we get a physical body, 
But in a manner of speaking, that physical body is a spiritual body. Let me suggest that we have to uh, differentiate now here between a spirit body. See, here's pre-earth existence over here. And here we are in here with the physical. And then here's the, the resurrection. All right, now in the resurrection, these physical elements are brought forth. But the whole of it is made into a, a spiritual organism. Now, in order to, to see that, let me just read a few statements from the scriptures with you. This is DNC 88, verse 27. They who are a celestial spirit shall receive the same body. Okay, that's what we're talking about. The same body. Now, a, a verse above that, he says this. Notwithstanding they die, they shall rise again a spiritual body. It's a spiritual body. Turn over to Alma 11, verse 45. Here Alma says, Now I have spoken to you concerning the death of this mortal body, and also concerning the resurrection of this mortal body. He says, This mortal body is raised from death to life, but it can die no more. And then he adds this point. Thus the whole becoming spiritual and immortal, that they can no more see corruption. Oh, now, what kind of a body is a resurrected body? It's physical. It's a physical body. It's not a spirit body like this over here. It's the physical element, but in the physical reunion of the body then with the spirit, the whole is acted upon and a glorification principle takes place, the powers of God's glory. And these powers of God's glory are powers of life. And they quicken the physical body. Blood doesn't, there's no blood in the resurrected body. But the spiritual powers with which it's quickened are such that they animate and they quicken it. And the whole then becomes a spiritual being. Now probably the, the, one of the best statements we have on the, on the whole thing is over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where uh, uh, Paul is talking in his classic statement here on the resurrection about the different kinds of bodies in the resurrection. And, and we need to know that, that there are different kinds of bodies. Now he points out, beginning here, uh, this, this, this basic fact. And he does so with this explanation, beginning with verse 39. He says, all flesh is not the same flesh. There's different kinds. And then he illustrates with something that we can understand. He says, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. Okay? Now he says, there are also, in a like manner now, there are different kinds of bodies. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one. Now the word one in the Greek means separate, distinct, unique, nothing else like it. Okay? The glory of the celestial is one. It's unique. It's separate. And the glory of the terrestrial is another. It's unique. It's distinct. And then he goes on and says, so also now is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, and this mortal body is corrupt in the sense that there are deteriorating forces within it, and it's raised in power. He says it's sown in corruption, it's raised in corruption, it's sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it's sown in weakness, and it's raised in power. And then he explains, there is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. He says it's sown a natural body, and it's raised a spiritual body. Okay? Now, some people hassle the issue of, of whether you can progress between kingdoms. And what's the answer? And they kind of set up the illustration that we're running on a track and the celestial's way up a line, but we're still on that track and we're running along and we'll finally get there. 
Well, the point of the matter is we're not on the same track. We're not running on the same track. We haven't got the same kind of a body. And the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. It's a different ball game. It's a different creature. It's a different individual. You see that? That's what we're talking about when we get to the scripture picture. All right, now in that sense then, the, the scriptural picture indicates that uh, the resurrected body is a spiritual body. And then the question is, a spiritual body of what type? And there are spiritual bodies of the type that we call celestial. And there are spiritual bodies of the type that we call terrestrial. And the spiritual bodies of the type that we call telestial. You see? And there are different types, and there are different kinds of flesh, and the different kinds of beings, and that's the different situation. And it all depends on whether you get your home teaching done, and whether you serve the Lord in your visiting teaching. That's where it all depends. That's where it starts. You see that? Here in section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord uh, uh, deals with this subject somewhat at length. He makes this explanation, uh, verse 31, For by the power of my Spirit created I them, yea, all things, both spiritual and temporal. First spiritual, secondly temporal, which is the beginning of my work. Now let me come back here to the board. He is not talking about first spirit beings and second physical beings. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a different picture. So don't in your mind say first spirit beings and then second physical beings. Don't do that for a minute. Now let me read it again. By the power of my spirit create I them, yea, all things, both spiritual and temporal. First spiritual, secondly temporal, which is the beginning of my work. Now he's not talking about this, so what's he talking about? The first spiritual has to do with the order of life that existed when Adam was placed on earth. And then the second, which is temporal, had to, has to do with the order of life, which was actually a reorganization, which takes place in the fall. Now, for example, let me turn over to Moses chapter 3 just for a minute with you. Here you have the Lord telling us about the, the, the vegetable kingdom. And in verse 9, he says this, Out of the ground made I the Lord God to grow every tree naturally. Now, that's a physical creation, right? It's out of the ground. That it is pleasant to the sight of man, and man could behold it. For it became also a living soul, for it was spiritual in the day that I created. Now, he created it out of the ground. But it was a spiritual organization in a sense. Or sometimes you can get to the idea by using a hyphenated term, physical dash spiritual. You see that? Now, for example, with Adam in the garden, did he have blood in his body? And the answer is no. What was the quickening element? Spirit, right? Not his spirit, but in addition to that, the spiritual powers with which he was endowed and which he possessed, they quickened and animated his body, and they were so intensely concentrated in him that he could live and move by the powers of the spirit rather than by the blood within the veins. He'd had none of that before the fall, you see. Now it goes on to say, that this tree now, the trees then, were spiritual in the day that I created them, for it remaineth in the sphere in which I, God, created it, yea, even all things, not just the tree, but all things, which I prepared for the use of man. And man saw that it was good for food. Now, if man could eat the fruit of that kind of a tree, what kind of a person was man? You see that? He says, uh, uh, prepared for the use of man, and man saw that it was good, and I, the Lord, then... Uh, planted the tree of life and so forth. Now, coming back to section 29, he says, By the power of my spirit created I them, yea, all things, first spiritual, i.e., Adam, the order of life that existed before the fall. Secondly, temporal. Temporal is temporary, right? Temporal took the fall, right? The organization that's temporal 
is a fallen nature. It's one that's subject to death. And in the creation, God didn't just create us as spirits and then create us as temporal. We did the temporal. Adam did that. The Lord made the changes and the transformations related to it. But Adam was, first of all, a spiritual being, physical but spiritual. And then the Lord goes on to say, uh, first spiritual, secondly temporal, which is the beginning of my work. That's where he started. And again now, speaking from here now in mortality on to the resurrection, and again he says, first temporal and secondly spiritual, which is the last of my work. Now what kind of a body is the resurrected body? It's physical and spiritual, and it's the last work that he does, see? So that in that sense, then, you have uh, in the creation of Adam, you have the, the physical organism, spiritual in its nature, the fall comes along and makes it temporal, and that's temporary, life and death processes going along, and then looking at it from this vantage to the future, <clears throat> then it's first temporal and secondly spiritual, which is the last of my work. So that the resurrected body, then, is quite different than the physical body. Now, it's true that it's contrary to the laws of life for the body to grow on the grave. The body doesn't grow on the grave. If you have laid down one of your children in infancy, that child will be raised in the resurrection in infancy, right? And then it will grow and develop. And on that basis, then, women will receive their children and they will raise them, if they're faithful, in the morning of the resurrection during the millennial period. And their children will grow up physically, <clears throat> and a lot of us are going to grow up a little more physically, because the uh, laws of uh, the mortal situation sometimes restricts the full development of the physical organism. This will not be true, as I understand it, of the resurrection. Now, there's a sense in which Christ becomes our Father, not just in spiritual rebirth, but uh, he is the first begotten from the grave. And we understand from the scriptures that not only was he the son of God in spirit life, and not only is he the son of God in other ways, but he also is the son of God, the father, in resurrection. He was raised up by the glory of the father. And in that action, then the mortal or the elements of the earth then are superseded by the divine laws. And uh, the physical then will mold, mature on the basis not just of the physical plane, but will receive the divine attributes, the divine powers, both spiritually and physically, of our Father in the resurrection, who is Jesus Christ. Can you see that? Now that then will make quite a bit of difference. and. Uh, it's still you, it will st I'll still be me, and all of that. But added now to the physical elements that I get from my earthly parents in the day of resurrection, when I am raised up by the glory and power of Christ, then the divine attributes of Christ will center more fully in me. And if I can be sanctified by the Spirit into the renewing of my body now, as section 84 says, then that renewal will be more complete to the standard of Jesus Christ in the resurrection. You see that principle? <clears throat> right, now, there's a popular conception in the church, and I've got to hurry on this, that uh, in the resurrection, uh, the wicked really are just going to be resurrected and left over there. The Book of Mormon teaches us quite a different picture, and we need to get that, and I want to get that and conclude, and then we'll just have a minute for questions. But let me turn to 3 Nephi chapter 27, where the Savior explains the gospel program, which includes now not just forgiveness, but resurrection and judgment. That's why the prophet Joseph Smith said that the, first, the doctrines of resurrection and eternal judgment belongs to the first principles. He says this, Behold, I have given you my gospel, verse 13 of 3 Nephi 27, and this is the gospel which I have given you, that I came into the world to do the will of my Father, because my Father sent me. 
And my Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross, and after that I had been lifted up upon the cross, that I might draw all men unto me. Now note the symbolism involved here. That as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by the Father to stand before me to be judged of their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And so in the whole symbolism of Calvary, Jesus is lifted up by men, and with that symbolism now reversed, the Father will lift up all men and bring them to stand before Christ and be judged. Now some people conclude that if we're wicked enough that we will never see the Lord, that he'll just shed a tear of sorrow because we haven't made it and uh, say, you know, I wish they could be here, but there's an entirely different picture that's uh, expressed in the Book of Mormon. Well, again, going back to the dual nature of the atonement, we are redeemed then from our sins through the power of the atonement, and all men are raised up by the power of the resurrection. Now, the power of the atonement has no effect on sons of perdition, but how about the power of resurrection? It comes upon all men, and all men, by the resurrection, will be brought back into God's presence. That's the Book of Mormon teaching over and over again, that the resurrection brings us not to a reunion of spirit and body. But the resurrection brings us into the presence of God, all men, wicked and righteous. Now, for example, let me turn to uh, Helaman chapter 14, where uh, uh, Samuel the Lamanite is teaching us some sacred principles now in relation to resurrection. He says this, verse 15, For behold, he surely must die, speaking of Christ that salvation may come, yea, it behooveth him, and becometh expedient that he dieth, to bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, that thereby men may be brought, that thereby men may be brought into the presence of the Lord. Our resurrection doesn't just unite the spirit and the body, what does it do? It also brings us into the presence of God. You see that? And then he goes on and say, Yea, behold, this death, the death of Christ, bringeth to pass the resurrection, and redeemeth all mankind from the first death, that spiritual death. For all mankind by the fall of Adam, being cut off from the presence of the Lord, are considered as dead both as to things temporal and as to things spiritual. But behold, the resurrection of Christ redeemeth mankind, yea, even all mankind, and bringeth them back into the presence of God. Now we have a popular understanding in the church that that the resurrection is universal. And you won't get an argument in a Sunday school class if you ask this question. Does the resurrection act upon all people unconditionally? And you'll get an answer, yeah, it does. It will bring sons of perdition back and reunite their spirits and their bodies, right? Now you ask this question. Will all people, unconditional, regardless of whether they're wicked or righteous or what they do, will they come back into God's presence? And what will you get? And the answer is no. Now, what does Abinadite, or I mean, what does Samuel the Lamanite say? He says yes. He says yes. You see that? I've had people say to me, well, yeah, they might get around his presence, around the corner somewhere, but, but they will never see him, and he will never, he will never look at him. And then I have to turn over to 2 Nephi 9, to what we call Jacob's woe session, section, where he starts out and he says, for example, Verse 13, Woe unto the deaf that will not hear, for they shall perish. Woe unto the blind that will not see, for they shall perish also. Woe unto the uncircumcised of heart. Woe unto the liar. Woe unto the murderer. Woe unto them that commit whoredoms. Woe unto those that worship idols. And we could say, Woe unto the, R, you know, the R-rated moviers. <coughs> uh, woe to the pornographic literatures and the druggers. You know, all that. We could put all that in there. But note how he summarizes it in verse 38. And in fine, woe unto all those who die in their sins, for they shall return to God 
and behold his face and remain in their sins. Okay? Now let me put it this way. Let's uh, use what I call the mortal bucket here to get the idea. Here's mortality, and it's kind of like a mortal bucket. Here's the presence of God up here, and here's Adam, and he went over the brink, and he died down here, and we're down in this area. And uh, the way of the gospel is back up here. Now, what I'm saying here is this, that the power of the, of the resurrection is such. Not only does it unite the spirit with the body, but it will take every person and bring every person to that point, to the same point from which Adam fell. And it will do this without qualification and will do this with no, nothing on our part required to have it done. It will do it unconditionally. And then you face the judgment, don't you? Then you face the judgment. And then the question is, have you sanctified yourself along so that you feel comfortable up there? And if you have sanctified yourself so you feel comfortable and you've been endowed with glory, then what? Then the Lord will say, welcome. If you haven't sanctified yourself, then what? Then you begin to hunt for something down here, see? And what happens to sons of perdition? They're brought back up there, and that physical body, I venture to say, of a son of perdition is a spiritual as well as a physical body. It's restored. It's brought back. The atonement universally, the power of resurrection, brings it back there. And then they die a second spiritual death. And there's a withdrawal of the divine. Now, you can't die the second spiritual death unless the first spiritual death is terminated, right? And you're redeemed from it. And all men, regardless of their conduct, are redeemed spiritually and temporally from the consequences of Adam's sin, and this by the power of the resurrection, which reunites their spirits with their bodies and brings them into the presence of God to be judged. And then those who are filthy still, then they die a second spiritual death, and there is no atonement for that second spiritual death. There's no cushioning power. They are cast out. And those then who haven't qualified to stay in the presence of God but still have repented and done something of a terrestrial or a telestial manner, then they will be consigned to some form of spiritual death, terrestrial glory, while its glory is still, in a manner of speaking, a form of spiritual death in comparison with the celestial. And the telestial likewise, see? But the point of the matter is that the atonement brings every person right back to the point from which Adam fell, so that if I then at that point where I stand on my own, if I don't stay there, whose fault is it? It's my fault. You see that? It's my fault. Now, that's an important principle. Some people get the idea if they're bad enough, they'll never have to face their bishop. They'll never have to face their state president, and they certainly will never have to face the Lord because they're just out of the show and they go on and, and uh, uh, with that kind of a mental attitude, they proceed in life. Now, what we need to make sure that they know is that I don't care how far they stray, I don't care how much they, they, they corrupt themselves, the day will come that they will stand before God in all of his glory, and they in all of their filthiness, and they will give an account of what they have done and who they have become. Now, that's important. Let me show you how it worked on a young tow-headed kid by the name of Alma, Jr., who was uh, one of the rebellious generation of his day, and uh, who finally had the hearse backed up so that he could smell the roses and see what eternity was about and then had the greatness of soul to repent. But in that process now, note what he says. And I'm reading here from Alma 36. He's talking about the seriousness of his transgressions, and he says, Yea, I had murdered many of his children, or rather led them away into destruction. Yea, and in fine, so great had been my iniquities 
that the very thought of coming into the presence of my God did rack my soul with inexpressible horror. Oh, thought I, that I could be banished and become extinct, both soul and body, that I might not be brought to stand in the presence of my God to be judged of my deeds. Now, what did the knowledge of correct doctrine have to do with Alma, Jr.? It brought him to repentance. Can you see that? It was the thing that finally brought him around of what it was going to be to stand before God in his filthiness. Now, if we teach that principle, what effect does it have? It's the doctrine of eternal judgment and resurrection. You see, It's that doctrine, and we need to teach it, and we need to understand it. And in that sense, then, Alma teaches that the gospel is, is a restoration. Read, and I don't have time to do it, Alma 40. And 41, where he talks about being restored, righteousness to righteousness, corruption to corruption, desire to desire, and it's a restoration of what we have here, and a great consummation in that sense. On that sense, then, what did Christ do in the, in the atonement? In Gethsemane, he underwent spiritual death. See, there's two kinds of deaths that Adam instituted, spiritual and physical. And then, in addition to that, in addition to that, then there's all that we do, you see. And uh, what did Christ do then in Gethsemane? He paid the debt of our sins. What did he do on Calvary? He paid the debt of Adam's sin. He died spiritually in Gethsemane. He died physically on the cross. He suffered both deaths that he might gain the mastery of both the deaths. And having then suffered physical death and gaining the mastery of it, then resurrection does two things. It brings your spirit back to your body, and it brings you into the presence of God, into a comparable position from which Adam fell. And there you stand. And as Moroni, and I'll conclude on this in Mormon chapter 9, talks about this issue in relation to those who need to know it. He says, I speak, verse 1 now, concerning those who do not believe in Christ. Behold, will you believe in the day of your visitation? Behold, when the Lord shall come, yea, even that great day when the earth shall be rolled together as a scroll, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, yea, in that great day when ye shall be brought to stand before the Lamb of God, then will ye say there is no God. Then would ye longer deny the Christ, or can ye behold the Lamb of God? Do you suppose that ye shall dwell with him under a consciousness of your guilt? Do you suppose that ye, that ye could be happy to dwell with that holy being when your souls are racked with a conscience of guilt that ye have ever abused his laws? Behold, I say unto you that you would be more miserable to dwell with, with a holy and a just God under the consciousness of your filthiness before him than you would be to dwell with the damned souls in hell. See, the point is they're brought back, all of us. See, Now let's prepare for the day of resurrection. Prepare for it, because it will be just as, as scientific as the finest scientific formula if we have sanctified ourselves I don't care what people may think, if they think ill of you or whatever they may do, if you've sanctified yourself, then in the resurrection you'll bear the fruits of it, and you'll receive the glory with which your body is capable of receiving. Now that's the doctrine of the Book of Mormon, and that's all centered now in Jesus Christ, who is far more than our elder brother, who is our Lord and our God, and as we'll talk about in future discussions, who is our Father in rebirth and in other ways, and uh, who then also will be our Father in resurrection. I bear you my testimony that this is true, that this divine plan is a marvelous plan, and the Book of Mormon is one of the greatest, to me it's the greatest miracle of modern times. I don't know of a miracle greater than the Book of Mormon. May the Lord bless you, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Please discuss Christ's atonement in relation to his other creations. <clears throat> you want to do that? Turn to uh, Do you want to dismiss and then we'll do it? Oh. Let me turn to section 76 with you, verse 22. The question is, please discuss Christ's atonement in relation to his other creations. Now, that's a bigger subject than we've been on. <laughs> but let me give you some of the lead ideas. Section 76, the prophet Joseph Smith, as a part of the three leaders of glory, says this, beginning with verse 22. Now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all which we, which we give, that he lives. For we saw him even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father. Now, the point I want you to get is the next verse. That by him, Christ, and through him, Christ, and of him, Christ, the worlds, plural, are and were created and the inhabitants thereof, now it's not talking about our world, but those others, the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. Now it's not talking about spirit birth. It's talking about rebirth through the power of the atonement. See, uh, on occasion the prophet Joseph Smith uh, uh, put the whole of section 76 in poetry form. And, uh, oh, buddy, I don't know if I can find that right here or not. But anyway, in, uh, in that uh, poetic statement, then he talks about the universality of the, uh, of the atonement. I might have to just try and quote it if I can. Here it is. <laughs> He's, he's taking this same verse that I've read to you, and, he's, and this is how he puts it in poetry form. Keep in mind that he said, I can reveal a hundred times more about that revelation than I've, been, than I've been permitted to write. So when he writes this poetic version, at times he has to draw on that great <laughs> that abundance of additional information, and here's a case where he does it. He says, tis, t tis uh, uh, decreed that he'll save all the works of his hands, and sanctify them by his own precious blood, and purify earth from the Sabbath of rest by the agent of fire as it was by the flood. The Savior will save all his Father did give, even all that he gave in the regions abroad. Save the sons of perdition, they are lost, ever lost, and can never return to the presence of God. Now having said that, then he comes to this verse that right to the one that, I'm, that I read. He said, I heard a great voice bearing record from heaven. He's the Savior and only begotten of God. By him, of him, and through him the worlds were all made, even all that career in the heavens so broad, whose inhabitants too, from the first to the last, are saved by the very same Savior as ours, and of course are begotten God's daughters and sons by the very same truths and the very same powers. Let me just give you one statement from uh, uh, President Marion G. Romney that I really like. This is the Improvement Era in November of 68. He quotes several statements on the creations of Christ, and then he says this. From this and other scriptures we learn that representing the Father and serving his purpose to bring to pass the immortality of man, Jesus, in the sense of being creator and redeemer, is the Lord of the whole universe, except for his mortal ministry accomplished on this earth, his service and relationship to other worlds and their inhabitants are the same as his service and relationship to this earth and its inhabitants. Now, when he went through Gethsemane, he didn't go through Gethsemane merely for this earth. The key to it is that he redeemed all that the Father had put into his power and made by him. And there's a whole sermon on, on the, the cosmic picture on that that we don't have time to get into. Okay, any other questions, Will? Yes, I have two 
inherit it? Inherit it? Yes, but it was implanted in him in conception. See, Christ was born, born again. Now, you know what I mean by that? I'm born of a mortal father. He had the power to give me a physical organization. But he doesn't have the power to give me the life that leads to regeneration and the baptism of fire and the Holy Spirit and all that. He doesn't have power by conception to this. I have to go through what Joseph Smith called the Articles of Adoption, become the son or daughter, as the case may be, of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus didn't have to be baptized. He did so to point the way. Neither did he have to have any laying on hands for the Holy Ghost. He was, those powers are centered in him in conception. He had life in himself like the Father has life in himself. Inheritance? Yeah, but the process, he inherited because of his sonship, but the process was conception. The conception is the key to redemption in, in Christ's case. Okay? <clears throat> no, not that one. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <clears throat> uh, you refer to Adam's sin, but I understand he transgressed but did not sin, and there is a difference. Am I correct? And the answer is yes. I had a beautiful experience the other day. I was over visiting my favorite second son in Springville and his family, and one of the little ones was out on one of their trees, and there was a limb hanging down, and he was swinging on that thing that broke. And he didn't want to tell his daddy. And the sister to this little fellow was there, and so she went to my son, and she told him, not in the sense of telling him off, tattletaling, but in the sense of pleading his cause. She says, Daddy, it was a mistake. It wasn't a sin. <laughs> you know, I about died on that. Daddy, it was a mistake. It wasn't a sin. Now, Adam's transgression was a transgression. Not a sin. Sin involves the idea that you succumb, that you succumb to it, and you submit your will to, a, to the will of the adversary. Now, Adam didn't do that. Now, let me say in defense of Mother Eve, she was deceived, but she wanted to be. Why? Because she knew that was the only way. And she was just as noble in what she did as Adam was in what he did. But Adam didn't sin in the sense that he succumbed, but he did break it the law, and so we make a distinction between sin and transgression, or mistakes and sins. Okay? <laughs> if you read section 76, it tells us about the ministry of the various orders of life in eternity. The celestial has the ministry of both the Father and the Son. The terrestrial only has the ministry of Christ in the glory that he's acquired as the Son. He doesn't pass on all that he's got from the Father. So you get glory by works, and Christ will acquire glory by works. And this, the terrestrial world can. And then the telestial world receives spirit or glory and power through the Holy Spirit under the administration of the terrestrial. Now, the order of life on this earth is basically that, that the Spirit of the Lord is the basic medium of ministry to us. And in that sense, we call it a telestial world, see? You see that? But a real telestial world in the resurrection, as section 76 says, will be above and beyond our power to comprehend its glory. But it's, it's telestial in the sense that the medium of ministry is the Holy Spirit. Okay? Well, maybe we better go run and eat. Okay? Let's have prayer and...